Hello and welcome to the Footballers Mindset Podcast. With me today, I've got Tommy Hoban. Tommy Hoban. I thought you were going to let me introduce myself. You can no? introduce yourself, go on. We've got Tommy Hoban, who you've never <laughs> heard of before. <laughs> so, I don't need to tell you. Who did you play for? Did you do? Um, who did I play for? Yeah. I played for pretty much just one team, quite boring. Yeah. Uh, Watford for the majority of my career. A little stint at Blackburn and a bit of a stint up in Aberdeen as well. And oh, and a little stint at Wildstone. Lots of little stints. Lots of journeyman. <laughs> yeah. We call well, it. <laughs> ish, ish, yeah. Journeyman footballer. So the reason I've got you on today is because I worked with Tommy and basically I retired him from football. We did, we did, which is why I'm very surprised that I'm even here because, you know, we're trying to obviously big up you and what you do, but he ended me. Yeah, I did end you, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really, I did end you, but you can tell there was something going on in the background. So do you want to talk a little bit about your story? So let's go... Let's go back and talk about you at Watford and how you found it. And then why did you end up retiring? That's a long story. Is it, <laughs> keep it short. We've only got an hour on you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I guess my career, professional career started very well. Um, if, if I may say so myself, mm -hmm. I was uh, probably 18 when I broke into the team at Watford and, um, and yeah, every, everything was going really well. So we're part of, um, the year when uh, Zola came in and what yeah. got taken over by the mm -hmm. Pozos. I was kind of part of that sort of change. I was just coming through the um, academy at that time. I was probably quite lucky in terms of the time I came through as well, because after that, it seems to come a lot more difficult for academy players to break into the Watford mm -hmm. team. Cause obviously the team, you know, got better, ended up in the Prem. So I was, you know, I think I was quite fortunate. I came through when I did, but yeah, I got into, um, into the team back in, I think it's 2012 yeah. and played um, about 20 or so games um, in, a, in a run in that season and things were going really well. And obviously I was a, a centre back and um, starting to, you know, get quite a bit of interest and yeah, it was kind of the perfect start to the professional career. Um, then unfortunately about halfway through that season, I got quite a big injury, which sort of slowed things down. And, what was um, the injury? So that, um, I had an osteochondral legion in the on like the talus in the ankle. What? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's what I was like when they when they told me it was um, yeah. basically a big kind of like cartilage issue in the ankle, and it was something um, they were all quite shocked about at the time because you might see it in like maybe a 34, 35 mm. year old coming towards the end of his career, or an eighty year old. <laughs> That's what the surgeon said. Like someone just with wear, it was basically a wear and tear injury. So it was quite strange that I had it sort of that young, but. Um, I did and went off to America. Um, Watford sent me there for the surgery, which was an experience mm -hmm. in itself. Um, got an infection as well, which was which was fun. My leg basically almost fell off. But did it really? I didn't um, know that. Well, it was going like red all the mm -hmm. way up, and Jesus. I had to basically go back into hospital getting a drip and all that. But um, yeah, anyway, long story short, came back from that injury after about a year and um, got myself back in the Watford team and the season after that we got promoted to the Prem and I was sort of part of a successful team there played about I think 30, 35 games that year mm -hmm. um, we finished second in the champ and yeah it was amazing and so I was at 21 by this point um, I think I played probably about 80 odd games um, for Watford and things were looking like amazing and um yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to sign a five-year deal at that stage of Watford. And like, thank God I did, because from the next year on, like my, you know, the tables just massively turned in terms of the injuries. And pretty much every year after that, I had a, a year-long injury. <laughs> Jesus. And how um, did you deal with that mentally? Um, yeah, it was, it was really hard, really hard. Mm. Obviously, hence why we found each other <laughs> towards, towards the end. Um, mm. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was really tough. So, um, first of the year after we got promoted, I basically started developing sort of groin issues, which a lot of players, a lot of players do have. It's kind of an issue with like the pubis bone, but mm. it's, it's really hard to find out sort of what actually causes that. So I was sent around to like multiple different surgeons across the country and everyone had different opinions on what it was, but it took me about a year to get back from that in the end. And then after that, I got sent on loan to Blackburn. And things started quite well at Blackburn. It was going well. But then I, I dislocated my shoulder um, about two months into that season um, and missed about sort of four months from there. Um, and I got back sort of just the last kind of six weeks of the season. Um, and then, you know, the next year, I was about 23 at this stage, 
going back into preseason with Watford, I felt like I was, I was having quite a decent preseason and was thinking, right, this is going to be the year I sort of break in. And then um, about a month, about six weeks into the preseason, a couple of weeks before the season started, I did my ACL and that was the first ACL that I did. Um, and obviously at the worst time, so it was kind of August and that's a nine month injury and mm. that ruled me out for the for the whole season. Um, and yeah, I guess when, if I fast forward, go back sort of two years before that, when I signed kind of that five year deal, um, I was thinking, oh God, I got, uh, it's unbelievable, five year deal, like sort of big sort of wage increase, going to the Prem, it was like everything was, you know, all my dreams like coming true. And then yet sort of three years then into that or two years after that, sorry, uh, I hadn't literally kicked the ball at all in them two years. And then I do my ACL knowing I'm not going to kick a ball for the rest of this season either. And suddenly I've only got a couple of years sort of left on the contract and, you know, fears and doubts start creeping in. You start thinking, oh, you know, what's what's going to happen? Like I've, I literally haven't played football in three years. Are people mm. even remembering me? Um, you know, all the familiar stuff that, players at one stage or another in their career start to feel um I was definitely feeling but yeah so then I came back from the the ACL and went on loan to Aberdeen and um again started quite well for the first five or six games and then I did my shoulder again mm -hmm. which is another four months out because it needed surgery again um and then sorry this was actually the last year of my contract um this was when I went up to Aberdeen and um and so I came back from the shoulder and then a bit in sort of January time because I did it in August and then um, about three games after I came back from that I did the other ACL and so yeah it was just literally just one thing after mm. the other after the other and as you say at that point that was probably the lowest I got mentally because it was that was my last year I knew my contract was up at the end of the season I literally hadn't kicked the ball in four years and it was um, yeah it was it was it was very tough sort of mentally at any point did you think I feel like jacking this in what's the point um, yeah, yeah, I, I, um, to be fair, no, I, no, I didn't, <laughs> obviously, yeah, eventually, yeah. ultimately I did, <laughs> but, um, but no, during that period, like, I, I definitely struggled mentally. I think I, I wasn't myself, like, I, if you ask that like, my missus and stuff, um. Would you say he was depressed or not? I probably, I probably was without yeah. realising mm -hmm. that I was, so yeah, I probably wasn't the, the nicest person to be around. And um, at the same time we'd had our, my first um, child, Finley, mm -hmm. um, he's four now. And it's obviously it was a tough time for Christina as well. Um, she's my missus and yeah, like I probably wasn't there, like wasn't present, wasn't mentally there for her as I probably should have been at that time mm -hmm. because my mind was just focused on, you know, pain that I was feeling from my injuries yeah. and just what am I going to do? How am I going to get back? Just thinking about football and so all the time but I think at that stage I, I didn't really think about about um stopping it was more just I had to get back like mm. I'd, I'd been through so much to like literally so much to, to get myself fit over them sort of four or five years I thought I, yeah, I haven't done all of this for nothing like I have to get back I have to get back I have to get back and at that point my mindset was it was just like as soon as I get once I get back everything will be fine. Like that's, mm. that's what it's all about. Like I just, I know that once I get there, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. But, um, but yeah, eventually I, I did get there and, <laughs> and it probably wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be at that stage. Um, you know, when I was injured. And, Which you mean it wasn't what you thought it'd be? So, um, obviously eventually I, I ended up, um, retiring. Yeah. And I think, um, why did you make that decision to retire? I think kind of, yeah, so what, what I was touching on. So that whole time, like while I was injured in my head, I was building up once I get back fit, everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. Like this is the goal. Like I'm, It's going to be just like it was before when I was 20, 21, everything was going so well. I'm going to get back to playing at that level. I'm going to get back to, you know, the prem where I want to be. Um, I'm going to feel good physically and it's all going to be fine. So I was building this kind of, a lot of the stuff that we speak about, like I was building this kind of expectation up in my head of, of what it's going to be like. But then once I actually did get back fit, so after that second ACL, um, I ended up having a year without a club because um, I, I still struggled and I had to have a second operation on my knee, but eventually it, it did get sorted. And then I signed for Aberdeen a year after being out for of the game for a year. 
And I had my best year in terms of return against probably about 50 games, um, was fit for the whole season. But as that season probably went on, I was just starting to realize, you know, even though I was fit now, I still didn't, football just was, was no longer probably giving me that kind of satisfaction and, and happiness that, um, that I wanted to or I needed to. Like I didn't feel the same kind of fulfillment from football that um, I felt I probably like deserved. And, and so what did you feel like? like? It's weird. It's cause like, you know, it's like when, you know, you play football, like when you finish a game, um, you know, you, you win. Like I, I used to be on a high for like three, four days. Like you know, if we won on a Saturday until probably like the Wednesday, every, no matter what happened in my life, I'd, I'd feel great. Like it was mm -hmm. just a, a massive buzz, but I suddenly there started to be some games like we'd win, I'd even play well, I'd get in the car and I'd just kind of be driving home and it was just kind of like, I just wasn't really feeling anything, to be honest. It just mm. wasn't- like Empty? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Just kind of, I guess that, that kind of drive and stuff. Like my mind didn't feel like it was on the team or the performance and stuff. Because I still, even though I was fit during this season at Aberdeen, I still had, every week was a kind of a struggle to get myself ready for the game. And yeah. even when I'd finished games, like, I, I kind of felt like physically I was maybe 10, like 5%, 10% off where I probably wanted to be. Like there was just little things like the, maybe like the explosiveness, the sharpness that I used to have when I was younger. I know obviously naturally for all players, as you get older, these things start to, you know, physically it gets harder, but I was like 27, felt like I should be in the prime of my career. And I, I just didn't feel, um, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was at the level that, I wanted to be at or needed to be at. And it, it was, everything was just becoming frustrating. So like the, the enjoyment and the fun of, of winning and just playing football just, just wasn't really there anymore. I felt like I was always criticizing myself. I was, no, nothing was ever good enough, if you know what I mean. Mm. And so I'd, I was felt like I was overcritical. Um, even if I played well, I'd be thinking about just that one mistake I made or that, oh, this was sore, that was sore. I'd be worrying about how am I going to be fit for the next game and, it was just like so many sort of different things like that. And it just wasn't becoming enjoyable or fun anymore. And then I think eventually it just kind of clicked that I was, I was just forcing it, forcing it, forcing it, thinking because football was all I ever knew and I didn't see any sort of life outside of football. But eventually it kind of clicked. You know, even if it, if I'm not sort of loving this that much anymore, like I don't, I don't have to keep doing it. Like there's, there's a whole nother sort of world outside of there. And I think I just kind of realized that what they say, like my values are in life. Like I, I did value, I do, I do still value football and, and fitness and health and everything, but there's other things I value as well. And mm. I think eventually it just, it just, I've it's called click that football was no longer the right sort of path. So I think you're missing a little bit out here. So you actually, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you say you retired, I'm but you wasn't, at, for that bit. yeah, you wasn't at Aberdeen. You actually went to crew. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah, you went yeah, to yeah, crew. Yeah. You moved there. Yeah. You moved your family there. Mm. And wasn't it after like a couple, a week or so after moving everyone there, it was yeah. like, I'm done. Don't remind Christina about that. <laughs> still, literally, that, was, that still gets brought up regularly. Does it? <laughs> yeah. So you moved everyone. To, you went, I'm going to sign for crew. You signed there. You got an ankle injury. And then you was like, I'm, I'm done. I yeah. remember you saying that. I was like, do you want to? Yeah. So I think that was like the final straw mm. in the thing. Straw so that broke the camel's back. It, it literally, yeah. And it literally <laughs> was exactly that because... So yeah, I signed for crew. Um, again, so after that season in Aberdeen, if I'm being like totally honest, I probably, in my head, the season started quite well at Aberdeen. Towards the end, it sort of fizzled off. We didn't do too well. Results weren't going our way. And I would probably earlier on in that season, I was thinking, right, I have a good year here and then I can hopefully get myself back to the champ, which is sort of realistic goal for me. I felt like, you know, so I played loads of games when I was younger. That's mm -hmm. where I know I can play there. I'll start to be kind of happier there, if you like. But then when that season finished at Aberdeen, um, you know, there was a few champ teams that were kind of interested, but I wasn't like number one on their list. Yeah. And so I was kind of waiting a bit and offers weren't really coming up on the kind of offers that I wanted. And um, and then crew came in and crew seemed very keen. And I saw it as kind of like, right, a stepping stone back into England and then hopefully kick back on again. Mm -hmm. So then I, I went down to crew, um, and yeah, I think all of them kind of thoughts that I was sort of feeling up at Aberdeen suddenly became kind of intensified mm -hmm. when I, when I did move to crew. And then, 
um, I know I wasn't there. I wasn't there long, but yeah, I basically hurt my ankle in a preseason game, and obviously with my injury history, uh, I knew that like I've I've hurt this. I need to go off, and so I went to go off, and it was a little bit of a thing sort of with manager where he wanted me to stay. He was like, "No, you're staying on." I won't go into all the sort of details of it, but and I basically crumbled, folded, mm. and stayed on the pitch and tried or tried to for another five minutes, and then. You know, I could hardly move. So I just went down and just had to, mm. physio came on. I was like, I can't move. I need to come off and basically ended up um, getting taken off. But I shouldn't believe in that game and just thinking like, what am I doing? Like I'm um, 27, 28 years old. Um, I know I'm not right. I'm fit. Like all this, that I've been through the injuries. I'm letting someone just tell me what to do like this. Like, mm. like what's going on? Like I, I just, I felt, I felt kind of like disappointed in myself that I hadn't just just walked off the pitch and yeah. done what was right for me. And then I went into training, I think on the Monday or the Tuesday and tried to train. Ankle was was killing me because he wanted me to try and train, even though it was definitely mm. wasn't right for me to train. And to be fair, I wanted to train because I I was at this point, I was like terrified of injuries. Like mentally I I had any kind of pain, I had a really sort of bad relationship with feel in most players they'll feel some sort of pain then just think all right it'll pass in a few days if i felt anything i was mm. it was like the end of the world like it just because of what i'd been through in the past of it and um so yeah i felt i felt something in my ankle it wasn't right and um I, I sort of came in saw the physio realized i'm probably going to need a scan here and um I, I did and I came in one more day the next day and then I was just doing like some basic sort of rehab stuff with the physio and I remember just standing on like a BOSU doing like just some ankle stability stuff and thinking I, I can't stay here like mm. I almost sort of walked out and just left the gym at that point but just I just had a, yeah almost like a little mini sort of mental breakdown yeah. at that moment and I went home I was like to Christina I'm not going back tomorrow I can't I can't go in there I just I couldn't face even if it was just going to be like a month of just being injured again like mm. for some reason there was like, I just, it's like, I just snapped and thought, that's it. I just, I, I'm not doing this again. And, um, and yeah, that was kind of the final story. And I think in my head, like I'd always felt like if I ever did that, that was me kind of giving up and I was scared of ever sort of doing that. But for some reason, something just changed and I didn't see it as me giving up. I saw it as I'm actually taking control of what mm. I want to do at this point. And I remember talking to you about it. I think I thought to you, I think the day before did I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, I was almost trying to get like clarity from people. And I think you actually said like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? But you're looking for permission from people. I was, I, exactly yeah. that. Yeah, I was, but I'd, I had made up my mind and mm. it was almost me just like letting, I think people know that. And then I think when you heard me, you were like, yeah, well, it's, it sounds like you've got to do what you've got to do. Like if you're, mm. if you're sure, like you obviously made me kind of just double think everything and, and check, which is obviously the right thing to do. Cause sometimes you do get sort of panicked into them decisions, but if I'm looking on like almost 18 months now since I did that or almost uh, 16 months, whatever, um, I, I definitely haven't regretted it. And it's been the nice. right decision for me, 100%. Like there's definitely moments that I miss football, but I think that's normal, it's natural. Yeah, of and, course. And it's, uh, it's been your whole life. Exactly, yeah. Mm. And there's bits that I definitely do still miss. What do you miss about football? Is it the dressing room? Yeah, 100% yeah. that, yeah. Especially <laughs> what I've gone into now. Because mm. like what I've, um, it's quite, it's sort of being a, a financial advisor I'll probably talk about it later um it's i'm not a part of a big like company a big mm. firm it's like a family business so going from one extreme of like that like super social environment intense like yeah. environment of a dressing room to a lot of the times working on my own now it's quite um it's a big big change and that's 100 percent the biggest thing that i miss just kind of that you know, the boys, the interaction, just like the jokes every day, just um, stuff like that. And I think you don't realise probably how much you miss that until you actually do kind of leave, you yeah, kind of take course. it for granted mm. sort of while you're there. But um, but yeah, yeah. I get that. When you, I want to pick up on a point that you made. You said about you saw it as a failure when you leave or you left. And that's, a lot of people see that. They see it as a failure. And actually it's just a change of priorities. Mm -hmm. It's not actually failure. It's not failure quitting. It's actually failure carrying on doing something that you absolutely hate or it yeah. doesn't serve you or it doesn't make you happy. That's the fear of judgment, right? It's coming into that fear of judgment again. Like, what are people going to think when actually it's not serving me anymore? Like, say, my career path has 
completely changed and it probably will again. It's not failure. It's just my priorities change. Mm-hmm. You're like, your priorities change. You're like, you know what? I'm probably not spending enough time with the family. It doesn't serve me anymore. It doesn't make me happy. So I need to do something else. So I want to go back a little bit. So before you retired, you come to me. Mm-hmm. So what was you trying to get when you wanted to work with me? What was you trying to get from that? Was you trying to like find happiness again? Was you, what was you looking for in me? That's a good question, actually. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, never, I've never asked me that, have you? No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> never. I just thought about it. I'm like, well, if you knew it was bad, what did you come to me for? What was it? I think probably it was probably performance related, I yeah. think, in terms of I was still thinking I need to get back to a higher level mm. and then I'll be happy when I'm at a higher level. Um, I'll back to where I was before kind of thing. And so I was thinking, right, so I need to improve my performance and be the best I can be. And I knew as I got older, um, um, as a player, I began to realize the importance of the mental side Mm. of the game. Like it's, you know, all we train is we spend 50% of the time working on your physical side, 50% on your technical, tactical side, 0% on your mental, Mm. 90%, I think, of my performance was probably i think not just my performance most players is controlled by your mind mm. like we're all good players you're all fit you everyone can you know clip a ball pass a ball we can all do the same stuff but it's whoever can Chelsea kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like it's it's the yeah. mind that yeah. and being in control of your mind that brings all of that together and I was definitely becoming aware of that as I was getting older. So it was probably, I was going to you to try and yeah improve my performance, improve my mental state of approaching games and you know, feeling calm um, and trying to get the best out of myself. Um, but, then, but then also probably there was a part of it that was trying to probably enjoy it more again. But again, I, th- I, I always... At that time, I felt that enjoying it was just playing at a higher level. Mm. But then over the course of that kind of, yeah, period, nine months, whatever, it, my mindset kind of changed on that. I started to realise that enjoyment might just be outside of football, like professionally. Here's yeah. a question for you. What does mindset mean to you? <sighs> I love what asking this question. What does mindset mean to me? Because it means so many different things. I, I know the podcast called The Footballer's Mindset. I don't actually like the word mindset. But yeah. everyone talks about mindset, mindset, mindset. What does mindset work to you? Um, to you? What does mindset mean to me? Um, I think it's, I think what mindset is, is your, the way you interpret the, your, your circumstances and mm-hmm. like the, the events around your life. So, um, you know, the, the exact same event will happen to two different people, but their mindset is what to kind of determines the outcome of that event. The outcome of the event of that event is just how you end up interpreting it, if you know what I mean. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining this in a good way, but I think your mind mindset is yeah, just kind of how you interpret reality, if you know what I mean. Oh I get, yeah, I get you. Yeah. There's this remember one of my old coaches, so he used to tell this story and I always remember it. So he said, like, I probably told you it about sitting on the cliff top with the sun setting. So the sun setting we're sitting on a cl- cliff top, me and you you're trying to touch my leg like always. And I'm like, no, Tommy, it's not for me. It's not, not, always. <laughs> not for me at the moment, but it's, not- there's this bird flying around and then the bird goes into the sea, plucks a fish out of the sea and flies off. Yeah. And I say, Tommy, that was a beautiful experience. We just had like, the sun was setting. It was touching nature. It's or- fine. It's while <laughs> touching my leg, of course. And I say, that was amazing. That was the most beautiful experience. Yeah. You say, but what about the fish? Fish mm. just got brutally murdered. Yeah. The fish like guts everywhere. Mm. You hate animals. And then I go off and then you go off and my friends say, come to your friends and say, oh, I heard about that moment at Cliff. They had a, you had a really good time together. And your friends go, no, no, no. Like, it's that bird that got killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, see the fish. Oh, the fish, sorry. See yeah, the, the fish. The fish got absolutely see, brutally murdered. The They're not friends bird. anymore. <laughs> he can't be friends with someone who hates animals. Yeah. So we've seen the same thing, mm-hmm. but we've had two completely different actions towards it. Yeah. So that's the story one of my coach one of my coaches told me and that was the best way to explain it. So we can see the same thing, but what we see isn't the same. Exactly that. Exactly. It's the, that. In, the meaning that we give it, the yeah. interpretation that we give it. And if we give it a positive meaning, it inspires positive actions. Mm-hmm. If we give it a negative meaning, it inspires negative actions. So yeah. whatever meaning we give it, and that can be trained. So the whole point is 
Like your brain is not designed to think positively. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's designed to think negatively. Survival, isn't it? Yeah. Survival to keep you alive. I always give the example. You ever walked into Tesco's and gone, right, I'm getting this. And you walk into Tesco's and you've gone, it's just, what the fuck did I come in here for? And then things are just fucked off out of your head. Yeah. And it's looking for, what your brain's doing is subconsciously looking for ways for you to die. It's looking for the dangers. So that information gets deleted mm. because it's looking for the dangers. So, so the whole point is the negative has a stronger pull. So we normally train ourselves in the negative. Yeah. If we don't know any better. And it's mad, like you said about being at a football club, you'll have trainers, fitness coaches, analysts, masseuses. Yeah. Not one person really for how this thing works, which yeah. runs everything. It's yeah. complete madness. Yeah, because like when I think back to Watford, I, I think they did have a sports psychologist. I saw him once. Mm -hmm. I think I literally think I saw him once. And it was just like he got maybe like introduced, or one of the physios just pointed him out to me. Oh, yeah, that's the sports psychologist they just hired or something. Mm. Never was that you ever sort of was I told anyway, like how to contact him mm. or never did he approach any of us to see if you want to speak or never was there any kind of like training on, you know, what he did and how he could, how he could help us. It was just like a token gesture. I think like just ticking a box that yeah. they, they had one without any, you know, purpose of like using them at all, which is, it's crazy. Like, Do you it's, think it's football needs to change? hundred percent, hundred percent. Like any footballer listening to this now, like whether they admit or not, I'm sorry, but you know that like your mindset and how it, it, it controls everything when you go into mm. a game like when you're feeling everyone has them games where they're just feeling like you know just unbelievable like in that what's the like the flow like yeah, you're, flow. You're, when you're in your flow yeah. whatever and like feeling if, if we could feel that sort of every game like that's kind of the, that's the the goal isn't it Cause that's when you're like you're playing your best and um but the, i guess the reality is you're net you're not always going to be in that in that state so you have to be able to learn how to deal with that and the like for me always my probably worst periods of performance would come if i had a bad game and then it was just reacting the wrong way after it would lead to just a massive loss of confidence and then i just wouldn't be feeling good i wouldn't be trying the same stuff but yeah like learning how to deal with things not going your way because they're not always going to go your way in football no matter hardly what. ever going to go <laughs> exactly yeah like game, football is a game of mistakes you're going to constantly make mistakes exactly. and that's why form is a mindset problem not a skill set problem. Your skill set is exactly the same. You don't get worse. It's your thinking about it has changed. Exactly. You're thinking about the problems changed. You start believing different things. You have that yeah. thought in your head. You give it a meaning. Oh, I'm really bad. People must be thinking this of me. Manager mm. doesn't like me. And then you start spiraling. Yeah. Get stuck inside your own head. And yeah. then you overthink it. So you need to get out of your head. Yeah. And start focusing on the outside. So that's something completely different. That's called attention channels. We've mm -hmm. got like different attention channels. But no one teaches you how to get into the external attention channels. That's flow state. Mm. A lot of players get stuck inside here and then they struggle to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was definitely like that. Mm. I think the majority of players probably are. And like you, everyone puts on like a mask while you're playing. Mm. I've spoken to quite a few boys that have like maybe come towards the end of their careers or um, I have recently retired and it's only kind of them when everyone like admits it like all the struggles that they're feeling or because like while you're playing everyone puts on this kind of yeah say yeah like a mask like mm -hmm. to pretending that they're they're fine and they're in control of it all and these things don't affect you but they they do like they they 100 do like one of the biggest things i remember especially like the young players now um not even the young players i'm the old players but you finish a game and the first thing literally i'm being like there's so mm. many boys the first thing they do when they go in the dressing room they go on like twitter or something like that and start. ben foster said exactly that did he yeah he said exactly that so you was obviously at watford yeah and he said the boys come in the younger boys they get their phones out straight on twitter yeah well yeah exactly yes i'm saying searching I'm, themselves that's what everyone does yeah you mm. see people like on the bus on the way home sitting there like you mm. see him like sort of looking at it and stuff and i i used to when i was younger as well as i got older i tried probably there still were times when I would do it but I tried my best not to because and you, you know you're never going to see anything good on there so mm. why look anyway but but you're looking for the negative comments exactly yeah you're not looking for the positive That's ones true, yeah. you're scrolling through going it might say really good Tom yeah. Hoban played really well you're like oh no 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 <laughs> no 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 oh there's a negative one exactly 
Literally. You don't look for the positive ones. No. Because the negative like, sticks. Yeah, you just said the mind wants the negative, doesn't mm. it, all the time. It's like wired to find, it's like a drug, isn't it? Like mm. that's what, you, you need to see something negative and like, yeah, it's this, and it's a shit, it's a horrible feeling. It's a terrible feeling, but you can't get away from it for some reason. And um, and yeah, like the mindset is just so important, like to learn just to deal with things like that. And I think the, the best players I've always felt are the ones that just seem to, that don't care about that kind of stuff the most. Like, mm. you know, I was thinking as a good example just recently, Jumba, Jumba Harlan, Jumba the first game this season, yeah. um, the and Community missed, Shield. Missed and he missed chance. it. Yeah. Do you see his face after it? Mm. Like he literally was just kind of like, just like laughing to himself. Like he's just kind of, it was just like funny. Like he didn't care. Like mm. remember, I remember Twitter after that, Instagram, all yeah, the yeah. memes, like, oh, they spent all this money, to, like just taking the piss out of him. But you could just see like in his face, he's just like, he just found it funny. Just like laughed it off, doesn't care. Like, but 90% of other players, that's them in their heads, like mm. straight away, confidence gone. And it would probably affect them for months maybe. Yeah. But yeah, the best of the best seem to just have that ability of, blocking all of that out moving on exactly. realizing that it's not the end of the world and you'll get another chance yeah. i remember listening to a podcast actually and um one of the blokes on the podcast said about this young tennis player when she made a mistake or she hit the net she'd just smile yeah which i thought was really cool and really yeah. nice because they're like well just smile i'm gonna make mistakes yeah i'm not gonna score every chance yeah but we expect to be perfect we expect 100 percent pass completion rate exactly yeah so we had kieran Last, he said stats, like yeah. the stats in football. People just worry about stats so much. So true. So true. Yeah. Uh, honestly, that's funny that you said that because say my last season at Aberdeen, like when I was younger at Watford, the stats weren't you know, so big then. But then mm. obviously I had like four or five years without football. And then I came back to Aberdeen, stats were everywhere. Mm. And even me. So I would, I genuinely, there'd be some games during the game I would probably play different passes because I'd be worried about yeah. everyone walking through and seeing, <laughs> or if I play this pass, I'm probably going to give it away. Mm. It's going to affect my pass completion. Madness. And, and I remember like the coaches used to go past and be like, look at that, like 88% pass mm. completion. Like, but that, I don't, that's, that's not good doing that, you know, because for young players going through and seeing, oh, that's, that's so important. That's like, playing with fear. It's playing with massive mm. fear. Yeah. And change it. And it's not going to, get the best out of you either is it like you want to be especially certain positions maybe not all right sent back like myself but you know midfielders you want to create a midfielder what i would anyway mm. like, to be trying them sort of harder passes because all right you might have 50 60 percent pass completion but if two of them led to goals then <laughs> that's what you want doesn't it like for me anyway but yeah yeah stats are mad so all players look at stats and they go i need to get my stats up because that's what people see they're like well yeah so I had a conversation the other day with a player and he was talking about stats and people only look at the stats and they're like, oh, people are not going to think I'm very good because I haven't got any assists or mm. I haven't scored any goals. Or I'm like, well, what about your work rate? And you're tracking back and yeah, like, people just look at the stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know there is obviously a, a place for yeah. it, but, um, but yeah, maybe it shouldn't be like paraded everywhere as, mm. it, as it often is at a lot of clubs now. Um because, yeah, I don't think it's getting the best out of people. Mm. So, let's go. You decided to retire. Yeah. <laughs> and then what? Because of you. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't me. You're the retirement coach. <laughs> yeah, I am. You should rebrand. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry. But it, you can see things and you can hear things. When you do what I do, you can hear in people's language. You can tell by body language, physiology, that something's not quite right. And you had to figure it out for yourself. I, th I think I could tell like quite a few weeks beforehand that you were really struggling. Mm. It was about asking <clears throat> questions to kind of try and get you to the decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 100%. Like, I think, yeah, like what you do is, um, it's obviously very relevant for, as we just spoke about, like the mindset and, mm. and improving performance. But also, yeah, like I, I almost, I know you, you, we spoke about this before and you say you don't like it, but like I almost did see you as like a counsellor as well. It's like clarify, like, clearing my mind and mm. just less, like when we used to talk I think in football that's um you know it's it's something I say that kind of mask that you put on mm. people want to act tough and like if you talk to people you know it's kind of seen as like a weakness and stuff Madness. like that but um but yeah and, and coming towards an end of a career like there's so many sort of worries and stuff I feel like you can 
like what you do can help a lot of people coming towards the end of the career as well just because that kind of mindset towards football is very transferable just to mindset towards life yeah of course it is yeah everything crosses so, over mm. like you said like having someone to talk to you so like, like a counsellor but I like to think I'm a bit of a lad's lad <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not, not your typical no you're not <laughs> yeah definitely not so I like we've become like really good friends and we should become friends and you can tell like I will tell you anything about me you know all about my life mm. like the baby unfortunately. shit unfortunately yeah. unfortunately yeah and I know everything about you and so that trust thing it's all about trust. I think that's what's massive. It's about trusting someone. And that's why I think it's hard for players when they go into, if they have someone in a club, they're scared that they're going to tell the manager and then they're yeah. going to be like, oh, he's going to go to the manager and say this and that and that. Mm. Because then if you go outside of that, it's, that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, again, a fear. it's a fear thing. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. Mm. Like within a, and it probably would get back to the manager as well. Like I know from my experience with a lot of managers are like, like they want to know absolutely everything that's mm. going on, um, you know, with, with, with players and, you know, I, I would probably, if I was at a club, I probably wouldn't feel that confident talking to, as I say, a club counselor, psychologist, whatever you want to mm. call it because of, yeah, that fear of like, oh, if I, I can't actually say what I'm really thinking because if I say what I'm really thinking and it gets back to the manager, yeah, then I'm obviously not going to be playing the weekend. And you know which is I mean? madness. Yeah, <laughs> absolute madness. Yeah, so which if is you why go, it is better being being outside 100. Mm, it astounds me that people go, oh, if you're not in a right frame of mind or you've got something going on up here, and we all got problems. Mm. Like every single person listening, we're all fucked up in some sort of way. Just some of us are willing to admit. Yeah, <laughs> we've yeah. all got doubts. We've all got insecurity. We've all got mental health. Yeah, we have our physical health. Mm. We have our mental health. Our physical health is how we feel within our bodies, like injuries. And then we have the way we think. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has great mental health. Yeah, mental. I think it's the stigma of mental health. The word mental health. Yeah. If you say your mindset is a little bit different. If you say performance, mm -hmm. people go, "Oh, performance." Oh, I'll yeah. go for that. Yeah, you yeah. go mindset mental health people go Oof. yeah no okay. that's what if you have a physical health you have your mental health people go they're completely intertwined like, of course yeah, they completely. work together people yeah. go to the physical gym but they need to go to the mind gym yeah the mind yeah. gym is the reps you do daily that makes you stronger and realising and working on can I see the positive and the negative mm -hmm. can I think about things a little bit different, differently can I think about my thinking can I learn about think how about your thinking? That's a bit. That's a good one. That yeah. That's where it all starts. I think mm. like becoming aware, isn't it? Like that's that self awareness of what you're thinking. Yeah, thinking of. But that's how you change. So thinking yeah. about your thinking is called metacognition. I don't use big words normally. <laughs> so it's thinking about your thinking. So if you think about your thinking, so I remember seeing a diagram. So you have, if you have, most people have the same thoughts daily. If mm. you have the same thoughts. You have the same behaviours, the same actions, and the same results. Because you think the same things. Most people, you can layer their yesterday, last week, mm. for example, on this week, you can layer their yesterday, on today, you can put their today onto tomorrow. Yeah, It's just the same over and over because you have yeah. the same thoughts over and over. So to change that, you need to think about your thinking. You need to, I don't like the word meditate, but meditate on it and think and ask questions. So that's what the reason for the journal. Because yeah, yeah. it asks questions so you can think differently about things. Yeah. And that's what I'm for. I question your thinking. So yeah. when you talk to me, I question things and go, why do you think that? Yeah, yeah. Maybe exactly. you can, and you need somebody to, to prompt do that. You. Yeah. I need someone to do that to me because yeah. I have my own thoughts and beliefs. So I need other coaches to go, why do you think like that? Why do you believe that to be true? And I'm like, that's a fucking great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Because like, I can only see it from my perspective. So I'm in my own head where someone can see some thing completely different so to change it you need to have new thoughts these to new behaviors new actions and then you change yeah most people were stuck and they're stuck in the past they're literally stuck in the past they're living their past over and over and over and over again it's like stuck in like a loop isn't it like yeah, basically yeah because they yeah there's there's think why while you're sort of stuck in that same sort of way of thinking there's mm. no way to kind of even think something else really isn't it you need something you need to like come in and just sort of break that sort of chain yeah like thing. you can ask really good questions so if i asked you a question which would be who are you without referring to your past <laughs> yeah, well, 
Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to referring to your past, who are you? So you again, if you refer to your past with can your injuries, you, can you can you answer that though? You're about, just a human being. Yeah, you're just a being. You're here now. You're not a footballer. Yeah. You're just someone, you're not thinking about your injuries. You're not thinking about all the shit that's gone on in the past. You're just yeah. here now, present. So who are you now without referring to your past? Yeah, a human. That's literally all you can say. So that clears everything. Oh, actually, that's, I never thought about that. Who yeah. are you now without referring to your past? Because you can't even say what you want to be. Because mm. what you want to be is like influenced by the past. everything in the past, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Stumped yeah, you that one, didn't it? That is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one. That's not mine, by the way. Uh, never, never yours. <laughs> it's a question. Yeah, it's not. You learn. Nothing. Things. Nothing. You take nothing. Exactly. Is anyone. So is you it? learn different things. But that's a great yeah. question. So, like, when you're feeling in fear and you're struggling, you go, "Who are you?" Without referring to your past, there's yeah. no fear there. Yeah, yeah. There's no fear. You're not thinking in fear. You're just okay. I'm just sitting here now, me and you mm. having a conversation. I'm just a feeling. It's really mad. Yeah. When you think about that. No, I, I, I feel you. <laughs> I do. Yeah, but it's true. Like. And I always think we get so kind of caught up in that, um, like, who are we? Like, what do you want to do? Mm. Like, 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 it's such an important, big question, but we're getting like really deep now. But like when you- It's good. Let's go you, deep. But when you come down to it, like you say, we're just a human. Like yeah. there's been, there's billions more of us. There's going to be billions more. There's been billions before. Like there's actually nothing- that special about you and that's i know not, that might kind of sound no, no like, that's cool you're not a big that's really freeing you're not actually a big yeah, deal exactly. you're not a big deal at all exactly. i'm not a big deal you're not a big deal but we make us that's our egos 100%, we think we're yeah. a big deal and everyone cares about us but really most people just care about themselves exactly we all got that like main character syndrome don't we like, mm. it's, which you you obviously do because you are the only thing like you know your interpretation of mm. reality is the only thing that is obviously real but um but yeah, but you're, you're not that important. You say it's freeing, isn't it? Mm. When you kind of realize that. And then like all these pressures that you put on yourself, like, why are you doing it? Just just be be in the present. Yeah. Live each moment and just without all these expectations, um, fears. of the future, fears mm. from the past, like they're all just irrelevant, aren't they? And um, as you say, like once upon a time, you weren't here in not very long. You're not going to be here. So it's it's all not that not that important <laughs> no you're right there's the chance of you being here if you think about it I remember listening to a book about the chances of you being here and the universe being created and it went so deep mm. <laughs> it was ridiculous I was thinking why do we get so caught up the chances of being here are billions of billions it's of billions mad, of billions I think one. I've heard this as well yeah, yeah I remember I think it was for reference for you it's Mo Gaudat Solve the Happy and it was like the chances of you being here it's like a monkey Writing is, I think it's Pride and Prejudice. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but it's like not just writing. So they they just randomly type into a book. Yeah. And not just not just a page. It's the whole book. Yeah, yeah. And it has to be an exact right sequence. But not yeah. just that one book. It's lo millions of monkeys really? writing, and it goes on for miles and miles and miles and they miles. All write the That's exact the chances same thing. of you being yeah. here. And we're like, well, we we waste it about worrying about insignificant shit. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And I we've know. got one shot at life, whatever yeah. you believe. But we've got one yeah. shot, and we're so worried about. I wonder what this fan thinks of me. Yeah, literally. literally. Dave up in the stands. I yeah, what Dave. It's thinks actually of me. it's crazy, isn't it? Why do you care? Like, mm. who who are they? Who are you? Mm. Who is Earth? Who is <laughs> <laughs> deep, mate? You've gone proper deep. You know that I mean? is deep. Like, it's true. Like, yeah, it's actually crazy. Yeah, when you when you go, if you that's thinking about you thinking you actually, yeah, you're right. Why am I so worried about what this person thinks of me? Why yeah. not just enjoy it? Because I hear so many footballers playing the game in fear. Yeah. They're just in pure fear the whole time. Mm -hmm. and they don't enjoy it. It's not yeah. enjoyable anymore. And you're like, just enjoy playing because yeah. you're gonna get to the end and go. Fuck. Yeah, hundred percent. And like, you know what? It's it's so true. I, I was saying, obviously, I haven't missed football since I've left, but there are you know things that I do miss about it. Mm. And playing in front of crowds, mm. like I guess when I was playing, I actually used to probably see it as I, I got better as I got older. But I'd be nervous the majority of the time. I'd be going out. I'd be thinking, oh, like. Don't make a mistake. Don't make a mistake. Which makes you make a mistake. Which, which does make, <laughs> make a mistake, exactly. Because you're yeah. not just saying the word. But um, but like some of the crowds I, uh, I've played in front of in my career, like I didn't enjoy it. Like mm. that thing of, you know, say if I go and watch a game now, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the players walking out and I'm, I kind of think I put myself in their, in their shoes and 
I think a lot of them probably are just feeling really nervous and they're walking out and they're probably not just sitting up, looking out and just thinking, wow, like, look where I am. Like, mm. this is literally the dream. Like, all these people have come here to see you and just, just soaking up that being there in the moment. Mm. Like, because when you do retire, um, that's something that I've definitely missed and I never appreciated while I was playing. Mm. So I'd say that any players that, you know, if you're still listening, how far in are we? 40 minutes mm. <laughs> into the podcast at the minute, just just enjoy it because it will be gone one day. Mm. And that is, it's a special, it's a special feeling and a special environment to be in. And you've worked so hard to get there. And and um, and yeah, I'd say that is definitely something that I, I do kind of miss just kind of, um, even though I didn't appreciate it enough at the time, mm. um, just being in that environment and the crowds and just just feeling it. Yeah. Mm. Like you said there, change your expectations to appreciation. Yeah. I told a story on a podcast not long ago. It's a story that I heard. And I've used it in a few talks because it relates. I actually do it with football teams and it's about this young lad, teacher from Australia, had a, said we're going to go and volunteer. So they went over and they found this kid and he said he was so happy and he had nothing. And then... He took him to the playground as he was taking him around this school in India. Mm. This little kid, he literally had nothing. He showed him this frame and it just had one literally chain hanging down from it. Right. And he was like, sir, 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 this, 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 this. And he's like, this? Like, what's this? He's like, look, a kid, sir, is lucky in Australia to have like this, like a playground like us. And he's like, well, and he had so much fun on it. And then at lunchtime, it goes, sir, 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 this, 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 this. And he just had a bowl of rice. He's like, yeah. look, I am so lucky to have food. Yeah. And then his laces was like, come undone. And he was like, sir, this, 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 this. Look, how lucky I am to have shoes, even though we're battered. Mm. And he's like, this kid is amazing. He's just yeah. so happy yeah. with what he's got. And then he ended up going to his town. He was like, he infatuated by this kid. And then he was at his house, saw his family and stuff. And the kids, be he went into the kid's bedroom. The kid was showing him around the house. He was, sir, 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 this, 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 this. And it was like a battered mat on the floor. Mm. He's like, how lucky am I to have this, like a, a bed? And he's like, Jesus Christ, I've been looking at life the whole yep. time the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, when you are a football player and you look at your shirt and you're doing the game that you love and you look around the stadium of people play, paying to watch you play, stand mm. there and go, this. Yeah, this, this, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Check, like, remember how lucky no, you are. It's true. It's true. People yeah. dream. You're in the 0.5 percent of people who make it. I think it's even lower than that. Yeah, probably. if you yeah, yeah if you go all the way to the very start, yeah, probably 0.5 like, years. Is that from from what age though? Is from that, that's kids going for an academy. From what from age 16 or from age oh like from from, from like age okay, being in the academy, start in the yeah, academy and then come through. So that's and then in the Premier League, I think it's yeah, like that's probably yeah. I think it's even lower now. That's but like, I think boys that. that actually 0. just play 0. football. 0.5% or something. 0.05% get in the Premier League. To get in the Prem. There you go. Exactly. Like, so one in 200 that start at yeah. seven or nine. So we're doing an academy, academy at the moment. So yeah. obviously, you know, me and Luke are doing an academy. Out 200 yeah. kids, one's going to make it as a pro. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. And do you think people, it's hard because I, I always say to people like, you've got, to, you, you, you have got to believe you're going to be that one. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, sometimes I'm starting to think like, is that even the right mindset? It's a tough one, isn't it? So yeah. you've got to believe that you're going to make it, but the reality is this. Mm. You've got to have that belief there, but go, do you know what? I'm going to put, and that's why we've created the academy to put things in place. If you do make it, great. We've given you all the tools. If you don't make it, we've given you the tools. Exactly, yeah. So do whatever you want to do, like you with your finances and yeah. the financial stuff. So why did you decide to be a financial advisor? <laughs> why did I decide? Um yeah. I guess there's a few sort of reasons, but um, primarily I was obviously introduced, obviously people won't know, but my, my dad was a financial advisor. So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that from a young age, as soon as I started um, you know, earning decent money from football, my dad was putting in, um, you know, putting structures in place that have left me in, you know, a comfortable position. And to be honest, the only reason I was, was able to make that decision to retire was because financially I was yeah. able to do it. I was had like a, I always call it like a comfort blanket to kind of help me transition from that mm -hmm. football career to the next career. And thankfully I was fortunate enough that, um, you know, thanks to what he did and doing the right things with my money, I was in that position. But I was, kind of what we were talking about earlier made me think like you're talking about physical well-being and mental well-being. Mm -hmm. 
I saw like a good little diagram actually. And it had, it was like, if you imagine like a triangle, sort of three sides of the triangle and like well-being, sort of being in the middle of the triangle, mm-hmm. like your overall well-being. And it had physical, sort of one side of the triangle, mental, mm-hmm. the other side. And then I think the other side to that, whether people like to admit it or not, is financial. Of course. And um, it takes a lot of mental capacity. Exactly. Worrying about finances. And even when you have, I've been reading, if you've read it, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I've just read that yeah. really good yeah. book. And it's about, obviously. What's the, his name? The guy who writes it again? Robert Kiyosaki. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So he says like the, when he says the poor work for money, the, the rich make money work for them. Make money work for them. Yeah. So exactly, you make yeah. money work for you, which is really interesting. And that's about having a, again, it's about the mindset. Yeah. And then people were in fear, even when you have money, just, mm-hmm. you're worried you're going to lose it. When you don't have any, you're, so it's constant, as you said, it's constant fear. Yeah. And it's having someone in place to help you with that. So exactly, yeah. I, I learned far too late about yeah. finances. And that's the problem. And a lot of the boys that, so I'm trying to start something sort of within football now, just primarily because I was a footballer, mm. but to, to help boys in, in football prepare for life after football. And you just sort of spoke about that fear. Um, I think it's only when you kind of get to kind of your late 20s, 30, when you start to realize like, shit, I've only probably got five years left mm. here. Like, what am I going to do after? All I know is football. I know nothing else. I've suddenly got a family. I've got kids. I've got a mortgage. I've got financial pressures. And kind of when you're in your early 20s and you know, things are going well, you're not like, you kind of feel invincible. You think mm-hmm. you can, this is going to last forever, but suddenly it's, it's not going to last forever. And I'm sort of, yeah, I'm just really passionate about trying to make them sort of the younger players and the older players realize that you've literally got a window of opportunity mm. in your sort of football career. And it's so important that you you do the right things and as you say, train, um, create the, the right mindset around money. And if, if you do that from a young age, you can sort of create that comfort blanket mm. and leave yourself in a really comfortable position when you do retire probably not to you know do nothing for the rest of your life unless you were you know playing in the prem mm-hmm. and in you know tens of thousands a week but but even even them like if as it always goes back to mindset you can be earning tens of thousands of pounds a week but if you've got a lifestyle that's costing tens of thousands of yeah. pounds a week and if you want to carry on living that lifestyle after football you'd be surprised how it how it can run out like unless you do drastically change your lifestyle so there's um yeah, there's, there, there's so much to it, but that's all going back to that triangle. I think the financial side of things is, is so um, linked to your overall well-being because, you know, I know myself that being in the position I was just knowing that I didn't have to sort of worry for a period mm. of time financially has enabled me to focus on retraining and not earning for a year so I could get my qualifications and, and start to rebuild again. But if you're retiring age 34, 35 and you haven't got that financial blanket, you haven't got, or, or you don't understand your financial picture, you might even have it without even realizing mm. that you have it. But then you're kind of panicked into just picking up the first job that you can yeah. um, just to pay the bills. And and then suddenly, you know, it's a it's a long life after football, 30 years of, of doing, you know, just whatever you can to mm. put put food on the table. But if you're if you're smart during that, you know, your playing days and, and as I say, create the right structures that then start to grow, grow, grow um with time, you can you can put yourself in a, a far more comfortable position. Yeah, I agree. I saw a story the other day about young footballers in academies and they got their pay packet, which was I don't know if you saw it, eight hundred pounds or something like that. And they both went out and spunked it. One got like a Prada bag mm. and the other one went and got a pair of trainers for like 800 pounds. And you're like, yeah. F- fuck are you doing? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We'll go back to like rich dad, poor dad. And one of the messages in that is like pay yourself first, isn't mm. it? So that goes back to the principle of every time you get paid, like a percentage of it. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously it depends how much you're earning, but say 20% of it, you, you put away, you're paying yourself first. You're saving it, investing it depending on what's right for you and your circumstances and but just getting into that habit mm. is is the most important thing the mindset and um they say that the, spe- the spend one a question we always ask people are you a spender or are you a saver mm. and 
just kind of understanding people's mindset around money is really important to um, trying to educate them. And and when you start to save and invest, it can get, you know, it's quite addictive because I start to see it at the start, it's, it's boring because you're putting in a bit each month and you don't really see much. But fast forward three, four years, suddenly, you know, you're still adding to it, but that pot's grown and that when you get, um, you know, interest and as the investment starts to, you know, compound interest over time and it starts to grow, you think, oh, wow, that's just doing that mm. by just leaving it there. And you kind of get more incentivized to put in it because you know that it's creating the life of the future. You know, that's your income for the yeah. future. And that's the way you got to see it. And it's all about educating people mm. on that. So me, when I was younger, I used to just spunk money for fun. Mm. It's only recently, not, not even that long ago, that I started to, to value it and start learning because no one taught me. My mum and dad didn't teach me. No one taught me it. And that's what we're going to do again in the academy. Yeah. Because if you help people at a young age, they've got them skills for life. They're not going to teach you in school. Exactly. Which is crazy. By yeah. The way. They, they it's not crazy. In school. <laughs> <laughs> it's not crazy. The system falls down. It, it, the system yeah. will fall down if you teach people how about wealth accumulation, for example, the, mm. the whole system will break. Yeah, that we're going to get very deep if we're going to that. We can, we yeah. can't, we ain't got enough time. <laughs> <Not> time. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah. like you said, people, I remember he hearing something, it was like, if you spread the wealth out, the money will come back to the people who value it most. Right. So it'll all come back to the same people because they value it. That's yeah. why you see like lottery winners go bankrupt. Yeah, you do. Because they yeah. just consume. All they know is consume and consume and consume yeah. rather than living within their means. Exactly. Mistakes that I make and still still make and always make. And that's why I'm learning it now. So I'm doing financial course and stuff. Mm. So what do you see quickly the, the biggest mistakes that professional footballers make with their money? The biggest mistakes? Um, I would say the biggest mistake is probably what you spoke about spending, um, spending it on things that you think are so important at the time mm -hmm. that as you get older, you'll realize are just so unimportant. So like a young player suddenly gets a half decent contract and he spends half of that each month on a Range Rover or something like that. Just use your mum's old car. Literally. literally <laughs> yeah. That's why right. so I don't. <laughs> but, but, but I'd say that that, that that is a mistake, you know, yeah. that young players make. But then at the same time, you know, I don't advocate that you save, save, save and don't spend because it's all about a balance. Like everything, mm -hmm. a big part of my job is is showing people, it's, it's giving them clarity on their financial future. So we sit down and we literally map out what their financial future looks like. And when you see what that future looks like, it enables you to make better decisions mm -hmm. sort of now. So for young players, you can show them like, all right, you're spending a grand a month on that mm -hmm. on that Range Rover for a few years. That's 40 grand, whatever, down the drain. But if you were to put that That's somewhere up. else, mm. this is what that will look like in 20 years time. That could be worth 300, 400 grand. Then suddenly you can get a house mm. like this. Liabilities v assets. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. You, yeah. There's, yeah, that's what we do. We map people out, show mm. people their liabilities, their assets. So that's the biggest mistake. What other mistakes do you think they make? Other mistakes. Got to um, shoot for it. Well, I would say, I think it sounds like I'm trying to probably sell a financial advisor and stuff, but I think trying to do everything yourself and figure everything out yourself. It takes is, a long time. It takes a long time. And it's mm. also a mistake because you can't be the master of all trades. Mm -hmm. I always think that you, you actually taught me this, like focus on what you're good at, put yeah. your energy into um, the thing that's going to you know generate your own sort of wealth and, and things you value most things you value most mm. exactly and, and and so invest in in other things that will then um you know help better your overall situation so invest in a, a mindset coach invest in a snc coach invest in a financial coach mm -hmm. and i think um yeah sometimes players just think oh i can just figure it out myself i'll do it myself or it's it's not important mm. believe me it is important like all three of them things sort of that we just said there Nice, mate. Right, as we're coming to the end, we've got a little... We need to wrap it up, don't we? need to wrap it up. I've got a little, little game for you. Get my little cards oh, out. Oh, your little cards. You love them. They're years cards. and years old. That we were speaking on the way up, actually. It was like, like, I say, why have you got this? So most people know my mum passed away and it's my mum's... I don't know if you see it, it's my mum's writing on there. So it's very meaningful to me, even though it is, I'm never getting rid of them. It's great handwriting as well. Yeah, much better than mine. It right, is, I need to shuffle them up. So you've got 90 that seconds. Is the worst shuffle I've ever... What yeah, they're old doing? cards, mate. They're not like... Probably not where you see this, but you're absolutely having one. Yeah. Oh, I know. They're old cards. <laughs> they mean a lot to me. Right. Come on, bang them out. Right, you ready? 90 oh, seconds. Oh, boy, and then we're wrapping ones. up. You What's ready? the record so far? 
How many people get through? Oh, 20? 20. Oh, wow. Ready? Okay, go. Three, four seconds two, each. One, go. Music or TV? Uh, TV. Who's the best? Joshua Fury or Wilder? Um, this is old. Fury. Okay, cool. Do aliens exist? Yes. Kebab or a salad? Kebab. What's your best feature? Uh, we said this. <laughs> My nose. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite singer or band? Um, oh, wow. That's hard. Drake. Have you got any phobias? Um, failure. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, heights. Sweet or savory? Sweet. Night out with the boys or night in with the missus? Well, I have to say night in with the missus. But Christina, he's done you well there. Uh, Christina's not listening, night out with the boys. <laughs> invincibility or super strength? Uh, invisibility. Dirty bastard. <laughs> and or deck? <laughs> uh, uh, ooh, deck. Toilet paper, over or under? Um, over. <laughs> <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. Who's better? Who's the GOAT? Messi or Ronaldo? <laughs> Stupid question, Messi. Shower or bath? Buff. Your hero growing up? John Terry. Team you support? I guess Chelsea. <laughs> Who'd play you in a movie? Um, someone Ginger. Someone Ginger. <laughs> Matt, Matt Smith. <laughs> Alcoholic beverage of your choice, and that is time. Um, or oh, it's vodka lemonade. Vodka, vodka lemonade. Yeah, yeah. I want to do this one. I'm going to do this one, last one. Best player you've played against. It's quite interesting. Best player I've played against. Um... Name or actually that I found the hardest? Best player you've played against. Up to you, what meaning you give it? Oh, well, the best has got to be Drogba. Because it's Drogba. Okay. Yeah. Um, honestly, the, I remember playing against Ricardo Fuller when I was yeah. like 18, young. Mm -hmm. And I just found him really hard to play against that day. I don't know if it's, he had a great day or had a bad day, but I was young. He was strong and like tried to bash me about a bit. So, nice, yeah. mate. Do you know who Kieran's best one? What, you know, I didn't know this. Go on. Did Messi. What, in pre-season? For um, yeah, that he, when it was no, West he trained, Ham. No, he trained with them. Yeah, training Argentina. game. Training yeah, game, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, Messi. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's a shout, that is a very He didn't plug one, that Messi. one when he was on the podcast, but I'm going to do it for him right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, mate, thank you so much. How, did you enjoy it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was quality. Thank you for having me on, Rob. I appreciate it. No worries. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Listen, if you've liked the podcast, do me a favour. Give me a five-star review. You know it makes sense. Share it with your friends. Yes. And I'll see you on the next episode. Cheers, Tommy, mate. Cheers, Appreciate Rob. it. Thank you. Thank you, guys.